I loved how that happened. We were just standing around talking backstage saying, oh, we don't have any way to tell the people that we're ready. And then the lights went out and the spotlight came on, I guess. They're telling us. <laughs> it's time to get started. So my name is Neil Koppelman from M Concerts and <laughs> Thank you. And this is Suzanne Sparsh from 516 Arts. And tonight's show is a collaborative show between AMP and 516 Arts, and the whole shebang. You know, there's a story in an ancient way about birds coming to the birds. And it's a short story before the, from before the world began. From a time when there was no earth, no land, only air, and birds everywhere. Birds making huge patterns in the air. But the thing was, there was no place to land. Because there was no land. So they just circled around and around. Because this was before the world began. And the seasons were running and the light was expanding. And the sound was deafening. And songbirds were everywhere. Billions and billions and billions of birds. And 
and one of these birds was a lark. And one day, her father died. And this was a really big problem because what should they do with the body? And it was a big question and it was a big question. There was no place to put the body because it was not earth. And this went on for five or six days, and they were all trying to think of what to do with the body. And finally, the lark had a solution. She decided to bury her father in the back of her own head. And this was the beginning of memory. Because before this, no one could remember a thing. You were just constantly flying in circles. Constantly flying in here. You know, a few years ago, I'd been working a lot in my studio, and I was getting really burned out on all this equipment. So I was looking for places where they didn't use any technology at all. And then I decided to pick some place where they had nothing and go there and spend some time there and just see how they lived. Anyway, I happened to be in western Pennsylvania, I ran into some Amish people at a farmer's market. And they were standing there with their arms at their sides. And they looked so incredibly relaxed and happy. And they were selling vegetables and bread. And they looked so happy, just so peaceful. Like, if you wanted to buy their bread, that was fine. And if you didn't want to buy their bread, that was fine, too. And I thought, wow. I wonder what it's like to live that way. And for a lot of them, time had stopped back in the early 16th century. And they haven't used anything invented in the last four and a half hundred years. They still just use wheels and wind. So I was hanging around with them, and I, I asked if I could come out and do some weeding or cleaning up on their farm. And they said, sure, yeah, why not? That'd be great. And when I got to the farm, it started to rain. And it rained non-stop for days. And the family I was with was a couple. And their newborn, who never stopped crying. So we all sat around the kitchen table listening to the rain and the crying. 
waiting for the weather to change. And once in a while, the rain would stop, and we'd run out and pull a weed or two, and then it was back to the kitchen table. Now, actually, I, I like sitting around kitchen tables, but I'd never done it for days on end. And I was finding it kind of hard to remember why I'd wanted to come out there in the first place. And the longer I was there, the more obvious it was that I might have come in kind of a bad time. Because basically, there was always an argument going on. Now, I've seen grudges. And I've seen a slow burn of rage. But I've never seen anything like this before. This kind of slow motion of fury. The woman would look up and she'd say, David, you know I asked you never to speak to me in that way again. But since no one had said anything for, for hours, it, it seemed like kind of a weird thing to say. <laughs> So I did go over to the husband, and he, there was no reaction. He was like tuned to some other station. And it would be another hour or so before he answered her within some equally bitter comeback. Then one afternoon, the three year old named Aguila, which is Spanish for North Wind, began a temper tantrum that went on for hours. And his mother's holding him, and he's kicking her in the face and screaming, and she's saying, Now, Aguila. You know that we agreed that if you would stop kicking mommy in the head, you would, we would revise our agreement about suspending your privileges for next week, and on and on like this. And I'm thinking, what does she think this is? The UN? I mean, this kid is trying to kill her. And I thought, you know, this is just never going to end. And then a dense fog rolled in, and we're back to sitting at the kitchen table staring at each other. <laughs> then one day, the grandma came to visit, and she joined us around the table, and she keeps saying to Aguilan, Now, Aguilan, give grandma a kiss. Will you just give her a kiss? Come on, just one kiss. And he's on the spot now, and I can see the look in his eyes, and it's the weary, hunted look of someone who suddenly realizes he's about to be tricked. But she keeps saying, so, when will you kiss Grandma? When will you kiss her? And she keeps repeating this over and over like a loop. And finally, he mumbles, I'll kiss you when we're in the living room. Which I guess seems pretty safe to him since we've been in the kitchen for several days now. <laughs> A couple of hours later, we're all actually in the living room. And the mood has darkened even more. And she says, Well, Aquila, we're in the living room now, waiting for her part of the deal. And the deal he made slowly comes back to him. And you can watch him remember it. And he drags himself over in slow motion. And he puts his mouth to her cheek. And I'm watching it happen. A tiny boy who had just learned to kiss without affection, to kiss as a form of payment. It's part of a deal. You know, I spent a lot of my childhood hearing about the end of time. The apocalypse, the way it was described in Revelations, fiery and final. And my grandmother was a Southern Baptist missionary, and she believed it was her duty to inform as many people as possible about the end times and the rewards and punishments. 
Now on the other side of my family were the Swedes, who could really care less about the future. And our church was called a Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant Church, and it was basically like a coffee church. We'd listen to the sermon, and then we'd uh, go down to the fellowship room and get really wired on coffee. And the sermons themselves were actually just some pretty sensible advice about being kind to neighbors, and being reasonable, and the rewards you would immediately receive for acting that way, as well as a lot of stories that Jesus told about wise men and poor men and what to do in certain situations and how to look at the world as really practical things. Now later, when I began going to Italy, I looked at a lot of paintings and sculptures of Jesus, and they all looked so unfamiliar. In these paintings, he was never shown talking or gesturing or teaching. He was almost always pictured as a little baby being held by his mother. Or else, he was dead in her arms. Either way, he was not saying a thing. <laughs> now, by that time, I was doing a lot of work in Italy, and I often got booked into churches, which were used as theaters when there weren't services going on. So I'd set up all my equipment, keyboards, amps, speakers, on these big golden altars. And it was really eerie doing these shows, knowing that right behind me the whole time, there was an enormous, well-lit plaster cast of the crucifixion. So one night, I made what was kind of a tasteless joke. And the joke was, why is it a good thing that Jesus was born in New Testament times instead of Old Testament times? And the answer is that in Old Testament times, death was by storming. And then in New Testament times, death was by crucifixion. So instead of people going like this, they would all be going like this. <laughs> Which would have changed a lot of things about architecture, for example. So instead of the cross-shaped ground plan, the buildings would be sort of strewn all over, you know, like just much more abstract. <laughs> I decided to stay in bed until I could think of a really good reason to get up. So I stayed in bed for months. And I would just lie there and look at the sky and sort of drift. At the time, I could afford to do this because I taught at night school. Most of the accountants and secretaries were on the slow track going to school two nights a week for about 10 years. So I didn't have to get to work until around six in the evening. And mostly, the people in the class were really just exhausted and way too tired to concentrate. Now I was teaching Egyptian architecture and Assyrian sculpture, but I wasn't really keeping up with the Egyptological journals. So a slide would come up in class, and I would look at it, and I would draw a complete blank. I couldn't remember a single thing about it. So I would just make things up about this or that pharaoh, and the students would write it down, and I would test them on it. I figured so much of history is speculation anyway that it was really important to design theories for certain unexplainable things. Like, in some of the pyramids, there were these holes on the side and the exterior, the shape of mailbox slots. And they were connected by a long shaft that ran at an odd angle down into the core of the pyramid, down into the mummy's chamber. And nobody knew why the shafts were there. And so what I told the students was that the slots and shafts were oriented to the sun. So that only one day a year, let's say for the sake of argument, the mummy's birthday, the sun would stream down the shaft into the inner chamber and shine into the mummy's eye and wake him up. <laughs> now eventually, I, I did feel a bit of guilt about this, since this was supposedly a history course and not, you know, free-form fiction. So I... I quit. Not before I was 
fire, but it was very, very close. <laughs> you know, when the stock market is still crashing all over the world, Everybody's been trying to find our winnable friendly hit bottom. And you know, talking about the future is really an art form. It's really very, very hard. Now take the classic statistic. You have more chance of getting hit and killed in a car crash than dying in a plane crash. But things keep changing, so you have to keep updating the list. And so you have to keep adding things like being hit by debris from the space station, or being wiped out by a tsunami, or getting crushed by a crane falling on your building. And then you have to keep crossing other things off the list, like influenza, an avian flu, or getting trampled by herds of horses, or being hit by a blow dart as you come up out of the subway, or choking on dirt. <laughs> so it's like a huge project. Now meanwhile, just going through security at the airports has become so sad. Or could have been a lot of fun taking off your clothes in public. It's become so grim. No laughing, no talking, and when you frisk the old people, their pants are falling down, and everybody's standing in line in their frayed old socks and their possessions all laid down on these conveyor belts. Ah, uh, this world. Which, like Kierkegaard said, can only be understood when lived backwards. Which would entail an incredible amount of planning and confusion. And then there are those big questions always at the back of your mind. Like, are those two people over there actually my real parents? <laughs> Should I a second Prius? <laughs> and you, you who can be silent in four languages. Your silence will be considered your consent. Oh. 
and sorrow quiet here. It's oh so glamorous. So full of mumbo.
in the summer of 1974. It was brutally hot in New York. And I kept thinking about how nice and icy it must be at the North Pole. And then I decided, wait a second, why not go? You know, like in cartoons where they hand go off to the North Pole on their doorknobs and they just take off. So I spent a couple of weeks preparing for the trip, getting a hatchet, a huge backpack, maps, knives, sleeping bags, and lures, and a three month supply of bannock, a versatile high protein paste. It could be made into flatbread, or biscuits, or cereal. Now I decided to hitchhike. So one day, I just walked out onto Hostel Street, weighted down with 70 pounds of gear, and stuck out my thumb. Going north? I asked the driver. <laughs> as I struggled into a station wagon. Now after I got out of New York, most of the rides were trucks. Until I reached the Hudson Bay and I began to hitch in small mail planes. Now the pilots were usually guys who'd gone to Canada to avoid the drought. Or else embittered Vietnam vets who never wanted to go home again. Either way, they always wanted to show off a few of their stunts. So we'd go swooping down low along the rivers doing loop to loops and baby hueys. They'd drop me off at an airstrip. There'll be another plane by here in a couple of weeks. See ya. Good luck. Now I never did make it all the way to the geographic pole. It turned out to be a restricted area and no one was allowed to fly in or even over it. I did get within a few miles of the magnetic pole, though, so it wasn't really that disappointing. I entertained myself in the evening, I was cooking and smoking, and watching the blazing light of the huge Canadian sunset as they turned the lake into fire. And later, I lay on my back, looking up at the northern lights, and imagining there'd been a nuclear holocaust and that I was the only human being left in all of North America, and what would I do then? And then when these lights went out, I stretched out on the ground, watching the stars as they turned around on their enormous, silent wheels. Now I finally decided to turn back because of my hatchet. I'd been chopping some wood, and the hatchet flew out of my hand on the upswing. And I did what you should never do when this happens. I looked up to see where it had gone. And it came down, just missing my head. And I thought, my god, I could be walking around here with a hatchet embedded in my head. And no one in the whole world knows where I am. this one. I'd been up in Canada on a Cree Indian reservation. And one day, some anthropologists arrived in a little plane with maple leaves painted on the sides. And they said they were there to shoot a documentary of the tribe. So they set up their video equipment, and they asked the oldest man on the reservation to sing some songs. Now on the day of the taping, the old man arrived. And he was wearing a red plaid shirt, and he was blind. They turned on some lights, and he started to sing. But he just kept starting over, and sweating. And soon it was obvious that he didn't know any of the songs. He just kept rocking back and forth, and sweating. And the only words he seemed to be really sure of were hey, I, hey, hey, I, hey, hey, I, hey. I am singing the songs, the old songs, but I can't remember the words. Hey, hey, 
I am singing the songs of my fathers and of the animals they hunt down. Hey, 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 I never knew the songs. Hey, 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 I never went hunting. Hey, 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 I remember grandfather, he lay on his back when he was dying. Around this time, I went to Mexico to visit my brother, who was working as an anthropologist with the Tzotzil Indians, the last surviving Mayan tribe. The Tzotzil speak a lovely bird-like language, and they're quite tiny physically, and I towered over them. Now mostly, I spent my days following women around, since my brother wasn't really allowed to do this. We got up at 3 a.m. and we began to separate the corn into three colors. And then we boiled it and ran to the mill and back and finally started to make the tortillas. Now all the other women's tortillas were 360 degrees, perfectly toasted, perfectly round. And even after a lot of practice, mine were still lopsided and jarred. And when they thought I wasn't looking, they threw them to the dogs. <laughs> now after breakfast, we spent the rest of the day down at the river, watching the goats and braiding and unbraiding each other's hair. So usually that wasn't that much to report. One day, Luna decided to braid my hair in seal style. And after that they did this, I saw my reflection in a puddle. It looked ridiculous. But they said, before we did this, you were ugly. But now, maybe you will find a husband. <laughs> now I lived with them in a yurt, which is a thatched structure shaped like a cupcake. And there's a central fireplace ringed by sleeping shelves, sort of like a dry beaver dam. Now my social name was Lofa, which loosely translated means the ugly one with the jewels. Now ugly okay. I was awfully tall by local standards. But what did they mean by the jewels? Now I didn't find out what this meant until one night when I was taking my contact lenses out and since I'd lost the case, I was carefully placing them on the sleeping shelf. 
And suddenly I noticed that everyone was staring at me. And I realized that none of the Sotsil had ever seen glasses, much less contact lenses. And that these were the jewels, the transparent, perfectly round jewels that I carefully hid on the shelf at night and then put it for safekeeping into my eyes every morning. So I may have been ugly, but so what? <laughs> I had to chew <laughs> Full fathom fight, my father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but that suffers a sea change into something rich and strange. And I alone am left to tell the tale. Call me Ish. Your last summer, I got a job at McDonald's. And I decided to do this, I guess, out of cynicism. I wanted to see how mass production really works. I mean, how do you make something that appeals to a lot of people, whether it's CDs or hamburgers? I mean, how much sugar do you put in so that everybody will like it? Now, it's very easy to apply to McDonald's. The application form was half a page, and I was sort of vague about what I'd been doing most of my life. But I was immediately hired anyway, and I got my uniform and began the breakfast and lunch shifts at the McDonald's in Chinatown, just a few blocks from my neighborhood. Now the training is pretty straightforward. You just put the uniform on, and then you do whatever your trainer does. And most of the workers on your branch were African Americans and Chinese Americans. My trainers, Peng and Anna, were really fast and they were smooth. They were working in like a Chinese opera, calling out the orders and doing all this complicated behind the counter choreography. Now, everything at McDonald's has to be too much. The French fries have to be spilling out of the containers, the Cokes have to be overflowing. You know, like abundance, abundance. Now, it's really hard to put the exact right amount of foam on a Coke and then get it over to the counter without spilling it all over the place. But whenever I did this exactly right, both Peng and Anna would immediately stop whatever they were doing and clap their hands and say, Good! And I was so proud. Now on the second day, Peng said, let me guess, you're German, am I right? And I started to tell her the long version, which was, well, a combination of things, Swedish and Scottish and a bit of Irish and so on, but her eyes were blazing over, and so I said, actually, yes, I, I, I am German. Like, basically, I'm German. <laughs> and so from then on, they called me the German. Have the German come over here. Give the German that mop. Get the German that cop. And I did pretty much everything on both shifts, fries, burgers, the cash register, happy meal bags, stuffing with toys. And I have to say that thinking of myself as German was a big help. <laughs> now sometimes people I knew would come in and I'd order and I'd be three feet away and looking right at them and they'd say, good morning, welcome to McDonald's. Would you like some fries with your pie? And, and I thought, yeah, maybe I should wink, so they wouldn't blow my cover, but they just looked right through me. And maybe 
that I shouldn't have been there, so I wasn't. But I didn't take it personally because by this point, it was all about the teamwork and selling as many burgers as possible. And also, I was getting very, very good at convincing customers to add more and more things to their orders. But the best thing about McDonald's was that whatever people wanted, we had it. Medium Cokes, we had medium Cokes. Triple cheeseburgers, we had triple cheeseburgers. And it was the first time in my entire life that I had been able to give people exactly, precisely, what they had asked me for. <laughs> In last spring, I learned about a trip organized by a Buddhist group in New York. And the idea was to canoe down the Green River in Utah for two weeks in total silence. And then every evening, when we would study the work of Dogen, a 13th century Japanese Zen master who believed, among other things, that mountains are aware. And I thought that sounded great, so I decided to go. And before we left, I read some books about Dogen, and one was called Enlightenment Unfolds. And in this book, he tells several stories that are hundreds of years old. And one was about a meeting of a teacher who came from India to visit an emperor in China, Emperor Wu. And so the two meet, and the emperor says, You know, I've done so many things built temples, copied sutras, and supported the monks, and I'd like to know what all this is worth. And the teacher said, there is no worth. And the emperor said, so why is that? And the teacher said, these things are not real. Shadows. So what is worth, said the teacher? Worth is empty and not in things. And the emperor said, What have you come to teach? And the teacher said, The emperor said, Who is it that faces me? And the teacher said, I don't know. Now I really admire people who have no idea who they are, or even that they are anyone at all. So I kept on reading and the rest of the book, there are all these cons and poems and lots of lists of things to look out for when you're on a pilgrimage. And one list went like, don't pay attention to loud noises and shouting. Two, don't watch herds of pigs. Three, don't stare at big fish, the ocean, bad pictures, hunchbacks, or puppets. Four, don't pretend you have something in your closed fist if you don't. Now some of the book made sense, but most of it didn't really seem to apply that much to Utah. But I tried to memorize as much as I could so I'd have something to think about in the long weeks of silence to come. Now there were ten of us, and when we got to the Green River, we were joined by another group that we assumed were also students of the Doka. But as it turned out, they were more like an outward bound nature group. And they had lots of rituals and songs and ways of doing things that had been sort of cobbled together from Indian lore and various self help programs. <laughs> and we quickly realized that from here on out, the trip was going to have very little to do with silence. <laughs> They would start each morning greeting the dawn with a piercing, wordless, atonal song. And then every evening there was a ritual called the wooden spoon, 
which was you all sit around at a campfire and you pass a spoon around and you talk into it like a microphone, telling stories about your life. Which was probably the ritual we hated the most. <laughs> and one of the reasons we'd gone on the trip in the first place was to escape stories, our own stories of other people's stories. But by this point, we realized we had to do things their way, since they were the ones with the maps, and the food, and the canoes. But our group was always making mistakes, like stepping on a certain rare moss or shitting too near the campsite, or spilling dishwater near the river, and every time we did something to them, they would jump up and down and scream, we don't want to be nature Nazis, but you're poisoning the river. You're poisoning nature, you're poisoning her. And the camp cook would rip her shirt off and she'd throw herself on the ground and start pounding on it and yelling things like on Mother Earth. And we never really talked about why we didn't assert ourselves. Maybe it had something to do with the Buddhist approach of going with the flow. I don't really know. But every day, it got worse. They talked constantly. And I heard them whispering sometimes about being survivors. They didn't seem to be the type to be had been on any of the reality TV shows, so I couldn't really figure it out. But as it turned out, this group was also an incest support group. So they all told their stories over and over again about what had happened to them. And then one night, during the wooden spoon, two of them said they were dying and that they had only a few months left to live. But by this time, I had no feelings left for any of them. <laughs> There were just too many rules, too many sad stories, and I was full of resentment. They were martyrs and control freaks and sad people and losers. <laughs> Everything I saw in myself and hated. I no longer felt I could look at the mountains. To try and see if they were aware, it just didn't seem to matter anymore. The trip went on. Hardly ever rain. The giant clouds flew over and sometimes the rain poured out. It was so dry, the rain evaporated before it hit the ground. One day, I climbed up the bluffs to the top, and up there was another world of mesas stretching as far as you could see. Huge formations of red rock that looked like mammoth rapids, and a run-down old bar just the size of cathedrals. It didn't seem like they were thinking. And when you climbed them, the rock would crumble in your hands like a cheap stage set. And then I noticed that everything there looked like it was clogged in the action. Rocks teetered on the edge of the cliff. Boulders looked like they were right in the middle of rolling down a steep precipice. God. In time. God. In a moment. Like I was. Handsome and greater, I like and wear.